Thank you. I appreciate y'all having me. Um, this program was actually put together last spring for the South Carolina State Historic Preservation Conference at the Department of Archives and History. And it says South Carolina Railroad Heritage, what's gone, what's still here. While I'm using examples from South Carolina, the same story is true across the South and pretty much across the nation. So um, except for some introductory things about South Carolina, for example, South Carolina was a state that in the time the railroads began to develop, believe it or not, we were a leader. Normally we're 50th where you want to be first and first where you want to be 50th. That's something South Carolina tries to do and we seem to do it pretty well. But when railroads started, we were really in the leadership. Um, this is the best friend of Charleston on a trip on January 15th, 1831. Using the um, best friend of Charleston, the locomotive is the first American made locomotive to pull a passenger train. Okay, lots of South Carolina first. I'm not gonna do them all, but I'll run through several of them. Not so great as we also were the first uh, state to have a railroad accident. When the fireman got tired of listening to the steam escape from the escape valve, he tied it closed one day in June 1831. Killed him, injured the engineer, and a couple of bystanders. So that's another first. We also had the first articulated locomotive, and that's one that bends in the middle so it can go around curves better. And this, is, this was locomotive was actually called the South Carolina. It was built at the same place the best friend of Charleston was built. South Carolina Railroad was also the first one to carry mail for the United States Post Office. In December of 1831, they carried the mail for the first time. Not in this car. This is one of the ones at our museum in Win Winsboro. This is from the 1920s, but they carried mail for the first time, uh, 12 miles out to the end of the line at that point. When the railroad was completed in 1833, from Charleston to what's now North Augusta, it was then called Hamburg. It was the longest railroad in the world for a number of years until ones were built longer than that. When they started the branch line to Columbia in 1836, which was completed in 1842, this was the first railroad junction in the country um, at Branchville, South Carolina, uh, down in Orangeburg County. The railroads began to build in the 1830s, and you can see here over time, 1920s was the peak of railroad mileage in South Carolina, and that's probably true for North Carolina, I would think as well. In 1920, there were the 3,900 miles of railroad service. The blue lines are the main lines. Blue and red and green are southern seaboard and Atlantic coastline. And then the short lines. And if you look above Columbia, which is in the middle up, up towards 77, you see a little short 12-mile railroad. That's the Rockton and Ryan. That's the railroad that the Railroad Museum owns and operates now um, on there. So this is 1920. This is 2007. We've lost about 1,500 miles of rail in South Carolina from 4,000 down to around 2,500 miles of rail. So what's happened to those? This is the last Carolina special, which ran from Cincinnati to Charleston through Saluda. December 5th, 1968, this is the last one as it left Union Station in Columbia. So what happens to the train wreck tracks when they're gone. Well, first thing that sort of happens to some over the years has been rails to trails. Now, South Carolina is way behind the rest of the country. We only have 25 miles of rails to trail in South Carolina. Um, some states have much, much more than that. And it just depends on the interest. And usually that's started by private groups and support groups with some government assistance and sort of things like that. One of those is actually in Aiken, South Carolina, and it is a cathedral trail. It's not very long, it's less than a mile, but it is actually on the original roadbed that ran from Charleston to Hamburg in 1830. So you can actually walk a little bit of that original roadbed of the South Carolina Railroad. Track on the left-hand side, this is part of the, what we call the West End at the Rockton and Ryan, uh, which is part we have not yet restored. We're on 11 and a half miles of track, we've restored five of it for the large trains. We can run motor cars out here, and since this was taken, this has been cleared, brush has been cut, you can actually see the track um, a little bit better. So some of it is just still out there, and if you wander in the woods, you'll see remnants of it. Sometimes the railroads take the track up. Sometimes if it's too much trouble, they just leave it. Um, this is an example of one that has recently been taken up. This is the Port Royal Railroad, which ran from Yemassee, South Carolina, which is the main north-south line of CSX and Amtrak, to Beaufort, South Carolina, to Port Royal and Beaufort. Um, built in the 1870s, it was uh, the Port Royal Railroad. You know, the railroads all have nicknames. The nickname for this one was Dark and Dusty going to Augusty. <laughs> In, uh, two th in the 1980s, the state bought it in order to keep service to the port because uh, the railroads no longer wanted to run it. This was Atlantic Coastline. 
uh, and then the, the, town of, the county of Beaufort bought it in about 2008 from the state, um, and they wanted to use it for water and sewer lines and a hiking, biking trail. Um, so um, they, in their wisdom, um, scrapped the railroad. They got $1.3 million for the track. So this is what that looks like. This is Seabrook, South Carolina. This is, um, the, the, the Port Royal had a lot of uh, truck farms along it. So this was a packing shed here where they would load the trains with Port Royal. So this is what that looked like. Um, this is the last of the track being taken up. You can see the track uh, roadbed and the last of the crane is loading that in there. This is my $85 photograph. I was head of the Beaufort one day and as I came through Beaufort, I looked and saw this off to the side and I went down the road, turned around and came back and Barney got me. And so I got an $85 ticket. <laughs> but the beauty of the ticket is if I had seen it and stopped the first time, there wouldn't have been the Amtrak train in the background. So I got the Amtrak train coming in the Yamasee and stopping in the background. So in there. Um, we did get permission from the Port Royal, uh, from the town, county of Beaufort to ride the railroad with some of our motor cars and a, a high rail vehicle with a, with a video camera on it. So we videoed all but the last two miles of the track from the Beaufort station into Port Royal. Um, we photographed, we've got about a thousand photographs we took as well. Uh, that's drowned rats coming back. We hit a thunderstorm like I have never seen before. And the folks in the open air cars were absolutely totally soaked. Even those of us in closed cars were soaked. It was blowing so hard. But we were able to document the railroad. This was a trestle the Seaboard Airline used as it came into the station, which is now the Blue Marlin Restaurant in Columbia. Um, this was built in the early 1900s. This is a train coming across it, and if I'm standing right next to what is the Colonial Center. The Colonial Center would be right here today, which is where the Gamecocks play basketball and all the concerts and all are. So that's all gone. The city tore this down in the middle of the night, just about. No public hearings, they just started taking it down. So it is gone. This is the Blue Marlin Restaurant. The only thing left is the shed which ran along to keep people from getting wet when the train stopped. And when the train stopped at the Blue Marlin restaurant, it blocked Gervais Street. That's one reason why it came in at one o'clock in the morning and four o'clock in the morning, one northbound, one southbound in Columbia. That's still true today. We actually have a stop sign at the railroad museum that was actually used to stop traffic as the train pulled in and uh, would stand there until the train pulled out. And this is the, the tunnel going out. You can see just over the car there and that tunnel is now a walking trail. It walks from the Vista, which is a very popular dining artsy area, over to Sydney Park, which is the downtown city park as well. This is that same tunnel in 1917. Um, by the way, you'll see some photographs that look like this, and these are from Andrew Waldo. Andrew is the Episcopal Diocese of Upper South Carolina Bishop. He is a big railroad buff, and when he took the uh, call to come to South Carolina, he called me and he said, I need to know every railroad that was in South Carolina in 1920. What happened was in 1917, the Interstate Commerce Commission, the forerunner of the Federal Railroad Administration, realized that the railroads were not paying their fair share in taxes. They were underestimating the property they owned, so they required them to photograph everything from the biggest depots to outhouses. And all those photographs are in the ICC records at the National Archives. So Andrew goes to the National Archives pulls those records out, gets those photographs, and the beauty of it is normally if you want a copy of photograph at the National Archives, you have to order it and pay for it. These are in a document collection, so he can scan them. So he takes his own scanner. He has several thousand photographs from Alabama, which is where he's from, and Minnesota, which is where he was before he came. So now he's doing the South Carolina photographs. So these are great photographs. And I'll show you a couple others. we go through some others in a minute. We can't talk about what's gone in South Carolina without talking about the Piedmont and Northern, which was the only interurban we had in South Carolina, electrically operated interurban. Went from Anderson, South Carolina, Greenwood, South Carolina, and lower left, Anderson, where that branch line goes in the top, over to Greenville, and over to Spartanburg. Um, with passenger service like this, which you would typically think you would see in the north, this was the only one in South Carolina that operated from 1910 to 1964. Electric service quit in 1954 and they went to diesels. Some of the track is now used by CSX. Um, the company disbanded in the late 1960s. There was also a section of the Piedmont in North, in, in North Carolina that ran from Charlotte to Belmont. So it was two sections. They never connected to two sections. Never connected to two. 
Well, the thing that we know is left a lot of is depots. These are the depots that the Atlantic coastline had in 1920, and there's about 190 depots on there because I counted them one day. If you look at the seaboard in Southern, there was about 300 depots in South Carolina alone um, that were there at the peak in about the 1920 time frame. This is Lane, South Carolina. This is seaboard down in the coastal area. And this is a neat photograph. This was taken in the 1920s, just from the dress, teens or 20s from the dress. But you know, the depot was a community center. This is where the mail came in. This is where passengers came in. This is where people went on trips. This is where the newspapers were dropped off from Columbia or Charleston or wherever. So it's a community center as well. So this was, people really revolved around these. Um, we've got about 125 photographs of railroad stations, which we've been buying from a guy in Australia. And we don't know where he got them. Um, I don't know whether he bought a collection from somebody. Most of them were taken in the 50s and 60s. This one happens to be earlier. He won't tell us where he got them. He probably stole them online somewhere <laughs> and prints them out, and, pay, and we pay five bucks a piece for them. Um, so, so this is Lane. So we don't know exactly when they're taken, and he hasn't been terribly helpful in helping us find out about them. This is a National Historic Landmark. This is Charleston. This is a Camden Depot in Charleston, which was built in the 1850s. This is a photograph which is in a, the Best Friend of Charleston Museum. Um, this is from the photograph. This is what it looked like in 1977. The trains would go in the tracks you see here, and this was a passenger depot, and they would back into a depot, which I'll show you in just a moment. Um, this is 19, this is 2011 or 12. Um, it's been restored. The building on the right is now the Charleston Children's Museum, Low Country Children's Museum. Um, in there and the walkway through there and there are shops and, and restaurants and bars on the left hand side, the right hand side is a children's museum. This is what it looks like from the parking garage by the, by the uh, Welcome Center as well. This is the depot from the back, from the back. So at the end of that where the track was between those buildings, the trains would back into this depot where you see the openings on either side. This was built in 1850. That only lasted two years because it was too much trouble to turn the trains and back them in. So in two, I just stopped that after two years, turned this into a warehouse building, and now it's the Charleston Music Hall. So it's a great adaptive use as well. This is the actual Welcome Center. If you go into the Welcome Center in Charleston, that's it right there. This is all Charleston. This is all the Charleston Depot area. It's a National Historic Landmark District. Built in 1902 by Frank Milburn, who was the architect. It's called Union Station because it was the station for both Southern and Atlantic coastline. So Union Station, it seemed like DC Union Station because all the trains came into the same station. In Columbia, the Seaboard Airline was at the Blue Marlin Restaurant, so that was a different station there. So there were two different ones in, in Columbia. Um, the train stopped, and in, in 1920, there were 144 scheduled trains through South Carolina, and 74 of those were passenger trains. So, so two-thirds of those stopped at Union Station and blocked Assembly Street, which is a major street in Columbia. So they built a bridge over it, and that bridge was there until 1957. And the trains are underneath, and the traffic is on top. This is Cowpen, South Carolina, which is that's the main line of Southern between New York and New Orleans. Um, these are all depots were all built in the early 20th century. They're very similar in style to this one. They had several different styles and plans they would use to do the depots with. That one, like this one, has been moved. It was given to the town by Southern Railroad at that point, or Norfolk Southern. I'm not sure on the timing but given to it with the condition it had to be moved because the railroads don't like the depots staying right next to the tracks because they were right by the tracks with loading platforms for freight and they're concerned if it's still an active track, if there's an accident and it's being used for an, an event like this or a museum or whatever, they don't like the liability issue. So they've given lots of them to communities and they've moved them away from the track. This is Aiken, South Carolina. Um, this one, as you can see from the sign, um, after it was used uh, by the railroad, became a dry cleaner and pressing <laughs> facility. This one has been moved. This is Lockhart, South Carolina. That is the American Legion hut. Um, and it is no longer there. This is Dillon, which is on the main line of, Atlanta, of what was Atlantic Coastline, now, now CSX. And I'm going to focus in on that motor car you see there. That's an MT-19, which is the kind of maintenance away cars we use at the railroad. And this photograph is 1970 or later because there's an Amtrak sign up there. And that's the point in time at which the railroads began to switch over from these motor cars to high rail trucks, pickup trucks, which is what you see on the tracks now for maintenance crews. And the depot at Dillon is still used today. It is an Amtrak depot. It is a stop on Amtrak um, on the main line. 
This is Ulmer, South Carolina, uh, which is on 321 down towards Savannah, between Columbia and Savannah on the road down that way. This one is most unusual. Look on the right-hand side and you'll see the seaboard station uh, time schedule chart on the right. Notice those two doors. Not sure if you can read it, but the door on the right says colored intrastate. You remember Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896. Everybody remembers your eighth grade history, right? Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. Supreme Court says separate but equal. Jim Crow laws come in, so as long as everything's equal. So they created, at that point, the railroads created two cars, an African-American car and a white car. If you were African-American, you rode in the African-American car. Couldn't ride in the white car. They were not equal. The cars were not as good. By the late 1940s, they begun to change that a little bit because of the beginning of civil rights and because of so many black men had fought during World War II. They began to change that and they had same cars but separate compartments. And again, the African American compartments were not as good. By the 19, early 60s, the railroads had, there were federal laws that if you were riding a railroad, you had to provide uh, the same, anybody who paid the same price ticket had to have the same class service. So everybody was riding the same cars until you hit the Mason-Dixon line. And when you came into the South, the South laws were you had to ride in separate cars. So the Pullman porters and the porters would have to have the African-Americans move into separate cars. So what's unique about this photograph, and there's a fellow who wrote a book um, in Cal from California on the African-American experience in railroads, and he said that if you were riding intrastate in the South, they could put you in a Jim Crow car, a separate car, because you were not going across state lines when federal law comes into effect. So this sign, obviously, in Omers is if you were an African-American and you were going to be riding the train and staying in state, this was a waiting room. He'd never seen one of these before. He was absolutely ecstatic at this photograph. I mean, it's most unusual. Unfortunately, the station's gone. It's gone, along with the sign. I don't, I would, I'm, not, I'm not as interested in having the station as I would be interested in having the sign. Um, Ashapu is a typical station you would have found. This one is... We're still trying to figure out which ones of these are still here and which ones are gone. So as our guys travel around the state, they take detours to, us, to somewhere to see. And some had just freight depots like this one. This is just a freight depot a few, few yards down the track from the other one. This is Edgefield. This is now gone. This is a parking lot for um, the tech school. This is one that's unbelievable. This is Kingville, which is Lower Richland County. Uh, Kingville was a major interchange for the Manchester and Wilmington and Manchester Railroad and the South Carolina Railroad um, starting very early in the 1840s and 50s and it lasted up into the 20th century. So this was a huge depot. You can just see it. And the only thing left there is a historical marker. You can't even find the remnants of the depot anymore. The track is still there. It's CSX track now. But absolutely nothing there but the historical marker. You also had the maintenance of wage shops, all the maintenance. You can imagine the amount of maintenance required to maintain railroad equipment. The steam engines, the steam, I mean, how much maintenance they require is phenomenal. This is Columbia. Most people have no idea these existed. Again, this is one of Andrew Waldo's photographs. This is Columbia, a maintenance shop for locomotives and fenders and cars. I'll show you where it is. Um, see the roundhouse and the railroad yards? Um, and then the next, and this, you see the railroad station in front of it. That's the station for the Charlotte, Columbia, and Augusta Railroad. To the right is Hardin Street, and Allen and Benedict Colleges will be just across that other street, just off of the map. There's a warehouse. The Steer Supply Company used to be right in that area. There's a warehouse, now, an ugly warehouse there now. Midlands Orthopedic is right across the street from where this is. Um, so this is, the, this is the 1872 bird's eye view of Columbia. The Columbia, uh, most of the towns had 1870s where they had bird's eye views, and these are very, very accurate. Anybody seen a water tank lately? The steam locomotives required tremendous amounts of water. Every 20, 25 miles, they had to have a water tank like this with the huge spouts on them so they could dump water in. This is Ballantyne, South Carolina, um, just above Columbia, on the way up toward um, Lawrence, on the Columbia, Newberry, and Lawrence. And the nicknames, Columbia, Newberry, and Lawrence, CNNL, Crooked, Noisy, and Late. <laughs> this is um, a water tank. 
uh, on the Rockton and Ryan. Uh, this is a really important photograph for us because the 712 is the locomotive you see there, which was a 1903 Atlantic Coastline locomotive that was sold to the rail our railroad in 1941. It was a little too light for the railroad, so it was the third locomotive. It, we had two others. This, this one only ran infrequently when the other two were down. So it's unusual, and to find it at the water tank is really neat. That's up on granite blocks because the railroad went to two granite quarries, and it's being serviced with water. Um, when we ride by that, and I'm the, I'm the narrator on, our, on our, our excursion trips, I tell people, it doesn't look like the one on Petticoat Junction, and we've never seen any cute young ladies hanging out of it. <laughs> And if you laugh, if you laugh, you are showing your age because Petticoat Junction is not in reruns, I don't think. <laughs> Most of the people just look at me with this blank stare. What is he talking about? But the water tank is still there. So we have one of the few still remaining in South Carolina. Coal, the steam locomotives use huge amounts of coal, huge coal bunkers. They could pull a tender under this and pull a chute and fill the tender up with one slide of coal coming down instead of having to do it in a conveyor belt or something. Then they load it back up for the next one. I don't know of any of these still extant in South Carolina. This is in Spartanburg. This is the Hain shop. Spartanburg had the Hain shop, which was a main, major maintenance of way facility for uh, Southern Railroad. It was right where Heron Circle is, and uh, it's all gone. This was a car straightener. Um, if you couple cars too fast and too hard, sometimes they'll bend the frames a little bit, and this was to straighten the frames out on both passenger cars and freight cars. This is a neat, again, this is one of um, Andrew's photographs, and you'll see the maintenance of way car. This is 1917, so that's a fairly early maintenance of way car, and I'll talk about that more in a second. But this is up here to really look at um, how railroads interchange. If they have to cross each other, you see the thing in the middle of the track between the two tracks? That's called the diamond. So the term for when trains pass at the same level, it's called the diamond, and there are lights and so forth, so they won't crash, hopefully. The other ways you can do that is you can build a bridge for one train over the top of the other train, or you can dig a cut. Well, the people in Conway, South Carolina have come up with a unique way. It was called the track compensator leveler. And how this works, <laughs> how this works is you can see from left to right across there is one railroad, okay? And you see the tracks leading up to it. So when they wanted to use the track that's leading up to it, two guys got on the top of this and cranked that other track all the way up to the top so the other train could go underneath. Then when it went underneath, they let it back down again. Never seen one of these. Sent this to a lot of my railroad buddies and nobody's ever seen one like it. It's gone, unfortunately. It's right down on the waterfront in Conway. There's a, a, a fish restaurant and whatnot there now, but it is gone. And this is where it was located if you know Conway. Um, houses, some of the railroads actually built houses. This was the superintendent's house in Pendleton for the Blue Ridge Railroad, which ran up to uh, Wild Hollow. This was the one that was going to go on on Knoxville, which didn't make it. It was never completed, but the Blue Ridge finished as far as, um, as Wild Hollow. The one thing which is completely gone, which was all over South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Virginia, were logging railroads. Hundreds of them. Columbia, South Carolina had over 100 logging railroads. Um, these were the railroads that went from a, a branch line out into the woods, and they built the logging railroads on a temporary basis. If you look at that track, that track is not real ties like you see out here. That track is logs, and they just put the track on top of that, and instead of putting the tie plate in place to hold it, they put the spikes directly on the rail. They would run it out into the woods where they were logging. They would log it out. Once they logged it out, they'd take the track up, they'd take the logs, and they'd go somewhere else with it. You know, so they were very temporary. Um, Genius. And, but probably had lots of derailments, would be my guess, <laughs> um, over time and well. So this is a logging, uh, just a, a scene from a Conway, Conway area. You can see the logs loaded up. Look at the size of those logs. These are early 20th century. This is low country, South Carolina. Um, look at the size of those logs. And this is the Anderson Lumber Company in Marion, South Carolina, in Marion County. There were probably a dozen huge lumbering companies in the coast, mostly in the coastal areas, and then smaller ones, even as far upstate as Pickens and Oconee counties, there were logging railroads. They're all gone. The last logging railroad, which was a branch line that ran logs from the plants out to the main line, was the Hampton and Branchville. And Hampton and Branchville stopped operating logging in the early 60s and switched over to coal. They took coal into the uh, SCNG plant at Kennedy, South Carolina. That's now been converted to natural gas. Hampton and Branchville's closed. 
And then this is the uh, logging railroad taking, taking the finished product on flat cars out to a main line. This is unusual because it's an electric railroad. This went probably just a mile or two from the plant out to the connection with wherever the major railroad that was going to move that on for them. Also, um, we're trying to preserve rolling stock as much as possible. This is Southern Railroad's dining car number 3157. This is in Union Station in Washington, taken in the late 1940s. Notice it still has a Celestial on top in there, and uh, they put air conditioning in this dining car and reconfigured it in the 19, late 1940s. It is at Rockton. We own it. It's on the South Carolina Railroad Museum, but notice they took the Celestial off the top, they put air conditioning in, they took out the Jim Crow section of the dining car, it had a Jim Crow section in the dining car. Um, that's mostly gone, there's still tables there, but it's not separated the same way um, in there as well. So this is our first class car. Um, right now it's out of service in the, heat, in the warm weather, we use it in cold weather, the air conditioner died. The 40-year-old air conditioner, finally, we have finally had to give it last rights. So we're raising money now to put a new air conditioner in it and try to use it. But this is an example of one that's been preserved. We use this at Valentine's for our Valentine's dinner trains. This is the Norfolk. This is an executive car from the Seaboard Airline built in 1911 for one of the executives of vice presidents. It has three bedrooms, three bathrooms, a dining room, an area for the porter, and a sitting area as well. And uh, the kids who we give tours at the railroad who come for rides and all, uh, I try to tell them, I say, this is an executive jet. And then they understand what I'm talking about. This is a corporate jet of its era. And this is at the railroad. These are transfer cabooses. These were built in Spartanburg at the Haines shop in the 50s. They built about 25 of them. They're transfer cabooses. They did not go out on the main line between towns. They would be used to transfer cars from the Southern Railroad yard in Columbia to the Atlantic Coastline Railroad yard. So the crew would be able to ride outside didn't have to worry about having a place to sleep or whatever, so they could ride outside on either end of it. They built about 25 of them. There are about five of them still left. We have two of them. And this is one of our open air cars. It's a cab area inside. They stored tools and equipment and whatnot inside of it. And there was a desk in there for the conductor to be able to write uh, car changing orders and things like that. This is the um, Hampton and Branchville 44. This is sort of the signature piece. This is um, one of the uh, major pieces that's been re re remained in the state. This was built in 1924 for the Hampton and Branchville, and it only ever ran in South Carolina. It came down to Hampton and Branchville and never been out of South Carolina in operating condition. I'm not going back to depots, but we're also worried about collecting artifacts and things from the railroads. And I put the Green Pond Station in, which was down on the seaboard because we have the stove you see there in the little exhibit we have of a depot um, is the stove from the um, Green Pond Depot as well. This was my lead slide. This is a Velocipede. If you think of uh, maintenance of way equipment, the first thing that was invented in the, 19, in the 1850s were the hand pump cars, which you see on the movies. Okay, so those were 1850s. Those were still in existence. That was a two-man job. This is a one-man car, and it was used by the track maintenance supervisor on a section. The railroads would divide their track into sections and assign a maintenance crew of three or four men. And uh, this was the guy who was in charge. He could ride the track with this, and he could pick up every broken rail, every missing bolt, because he's going slow. It's hand and foot pumped. It's like this. You can't pump a hand, hand and feet back and forth. We picked this up from, this was a Seaboard Airline um, philosophy. These were made in the 1880s. Um, and used up into the 19-teens. They're fairly scarce. There are not many of them around. This one came out of a barn in Dillon, South Carolina. And this was a gentleman who operated it and who saved it. He, uh, his name was Henry Stone out of Dillon. And this was one of Andrew's pictures from 1917. You see one of them sitting off to the right over there. And then you see the third wheel sitting off to the side as well over here. So it's, this had already, by 1917, been sort of put off to the side because they probably had a gasoline-powered one they were using. Well, let's talk about the Slew to Grade, and I'm sure there are people in here that know a whole lot more about the Slew to Grade than I could ever pretend to know, but it is the steepest standard gauge mainline railroad in the country. And the two key things are mainline, which means it's not a short line or a feeder line, it's a mainline railroad, and standard gauge, that's four feet, eight and a half inches. Um, the standard gauge in the United States since um, 1892. We used to have three or four different gauges. Um, now there are many um, narrow gauge, the three-foot gauge railroads in, in, the, in Colorado and, mid, and the Midwest. 
that are three foot gauge that have steeper grades. The cast railroads up in West Virginia are three foot gauge. They're logging railroads and small railroads, three foot gauge. They have steeper grades than this, but this is a mainline grade. They have some that are steeper. They have 6% grades, 7% grades on some of them. But they also use like Shea engines, which are designed specifically to run on those steep grades. The main line is the key in there. And this is the difference in the grade from Melrose up to Saluda, a distance of about four miles is the main part of the grade as it's coming up. One of the trains that ran on this was the Carolina Special, which ran from Cincinnati to Charleston. It operated from the early 20th century, 1911, to December 5th, 1968. I went to Walford in September of 1968, and my dorm overlooked the main line of Norfolk Southern Railroad at that time. And I remember seeing the Carolina Special come in. Unfortunately, it was not as fancy as this. It had been cut down to one F unit or one E unit, and maybe three or four coaches and a baggage car. This is the Carolina Special coming up the hill. And the 611, there was a video running of the 611 earlier. This is 1992. This is owned by the Virginia Transportation Museum in Roanoke, and it's been restored in the last three or four years. It ran this past season um, excursions out of um, Salisbury and Spencer Shop and out of Roanoke. One of my engineers is actually a crew member on this, and I keep telling me I'm not going to let him run our engines until he gets me a ride on the engine, which probably will never happen. This is a train bulletin board we have at the railroad in, in Winsboro. Um, came out of the station down in Charleston. And you can see it has printed in Charleston to Columbia, trains 27 and 28. And then, unfortunately, the, the chalk has sort of disappeared off the bottom. So I don't know if this might have had information on the uh, Carolina Special running or not, because I don't have a date on when this was acquired. This was acquired by the Charleston chapter of the National Railroad Historical Society in Charleston and given to us a number of years ago. Here he comes up the grade. One of the uniquenesses of it is that there were two runaway tracks, one toward the top and then one right down here at Melrose. This is Melrose and there's a little switch stand and the way it worked is the track remained in the runaway position. This was manned 24 hours a day and if the train did not provide whatever the prearranged whistle signal was, the switch man didn't switch it to the main line, he let the train go in the runaway track, and that happened a number of times. This one was about a half mile long from the information I have found. Um, I took this about an hour and a half ago, stop board number one, which is right down here, going down the hill. Problem right now between here and Melrose and on down is there are a lot of washouts. And I took this from just, this, this is just down the other side of the parking lot. You can see where that is washed out, and you really could not run a train on that track because a heavy locomotive is gonna push those ties down to the side, so before you could even run on this section of track with a regular locomotive, that needs some repair work and some reinforcing before you can even do that as well. We'll finish up with who's preserving the railroads in South Carolina, and I'm sorry I didn't go to the North Carolina ones. This is the best friend of Charleston replica. Southern was, um, uh, traces its history back to the South Carolina Railroad from the 1830s, and uh, they had this built to celebrate their centennial. It ran all over South Carolina for years, from the 1928 till the late 1970s, early 1980s. They didn't fire the boiler up. There's actually a gasoline engine underneath the boiler. It's now in a permanent home, so it's right across a little driveway from the Welcome Center, the, big, the place that has all the places where you pick up the buses in Charleston, yeah. tour buses. This is free and open to the public. It's got some great signage. Spartanburg has the Hub City Railroad Museum, which is in the old depot as well. They have the exhibits inside, uh, which focus on local areas, peaches. Spartanburg has more peaches than uh, Georgia does, or they did. And there and outside, they've got a 1947 Southern caboose, which has been restored. In Greenwood, South Carolina, it's not the Greenwood County Museum, it's the museum and historical center. This is the Rockton and Ryan number 19. This was the main locomotive on our railroad from the 1920s to the 1960s. And when Martin Marietta closed the quarry in the 1970s, they sold everything. And Mr. Adams from Greenwood bought this locomotive and its tender and had it moved by rail over to um, Greenwood. And then it actually went in on its own power the last several hundred yards in the late 1960s. Um, so this is over there, and they have some exhibits in the building nearby. They also have um, several pieces of equipment from the Piedmont and Northern. This is the Carolina. 
which was the executive car of the president's car for the Piedmont and Northern. And they also have a caboose on the back, which is a Piedmont and Northern. And they have a coach car. The coach car, unfortunately, has been turned into a classroom. And they're open on Saturdays. I don't think this is open every day. Check their website to get the exact times they're open. And then the South Carolina Railroad Museum, and we are an operating railroad. We're transferring our name or um, trying to migrate our name over to the Rockton Ryan and Western Railroad because people think South Carolina Railroad Museum, including our governor who vetoed money out of, our, out of their budget two years ago because she said we're a museum and doesn't realize we're a tourist operation. We bring 10,000 people a year into Fairfield County um, on train rides. This is our Christmas trains where we run with Santa Claus on board the train and he walks through the train so you don't stand in line to see Santa Claus. Santa Claus comes to see you. And uh, we're, running one, two, we're running six cars on this train with a locomotive on both ends. Every year we've run steam for the last five years. We're gonna skip 2017 and go to 2018. Either an 040 or an 060, which comes from Grambling Locomotive Works in Indiana. They have two locomotives traveling the country now and a third one underway. Their business card says, have locomotive, we'll travel. <laughs> and they come in on a low boy truck. They're about the largest thing you can move on a low boy. So they come in on a low boy and we unload them and run them for about three Saturdays and some special trips as well. It's fun to ride behind it in the open air car. You just don't wear a white shirt. <laughs> and we have a gallery, which is our two portable classrooms, which was just redone for us by students from the public history program at the University of South Carolina. We have a tremendous collection of dining car china from all three railroads that ran in South Carolina. And our most exciting news, this is a week ago Tuesday, uh, Norfolk Southern is delivering to us a new car we just purchased, you see coming in. It's a silver-sided car made by Bud in 1967 for the Federal Railroad Administration. There were four of these made, T1 through T4. They were high-speed track inspection cars that ran in the Northeast Corridor. They were self-propelled with electric pantographs on the roof and traction motors in the axles. This and its three other cars were clocked one time on the Northeast Corridor, 186 miles an hour. Uh, they won't run even a tenth of that on our track, but that's okay. Um, this had all kind of track test equipment in it, so we're in the process of gutting the interior and we're gonna turn it into an Art Deco lounge car. And this past Tuesday night at eight o'clock, Norfolk Southern delivered to us three bi-level coaches. They started life in Chicago at Metra and then went to Virginia Railway Express. These were commuter coaches. Uh, they'll seat about 160 apiece. They're loaded from a lower level, which you see there, and they have regular coach seating on the bottom level, and then the top level is uh, individual seating on both sides with an atrium down to the main floor on the bottom. Uh, these require what we call head end power, which we do not have a generator car, so we're in the process of trying to get a generator car built so we can power these. They're heated and air conditioned. The windows don't open, so we can't run them without heat and air conditioning. We can run them in Columbia even at Christmas time without heat um, because it's sometimes so warm in Columbia that we have to run air conditioning. So that's a quick look at uh, the railroads in South Carolina and what's going on. It's typical of what's going on elsewhere as well. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>